it's, it's awkward being straight. And <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Brothers, sisters, what a beautiful day we have today as well. It's not too hot, not too cold. Just uh, perfect to be able to come uh, gather together this morning and then be able to even spend some time later outside in fellowship. So I will uh, invite you all to stand up with me as we will read God's word. Today we will be reading from Psalm 48. Psalm 48. I'll give you a minute to turn there before we start. So here it is, Psalm 48. Zion, the city of our God. A song, a psalm of the sons of Korah. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. His holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, is the joy of all the earth. Mount Zion, in the far north, the city of the great king. Within her citadels, God has made himself known as a fortress. For behold, the kings assembled, they came on together. As soon as they saw it, they were astounded. They were in panic, they took to flight. Trembling took hold of them there, anguish as of a woman in labor. By the east wind you shattered the ships of Tarshish. As we have heard, so have we seen. In the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, which God will establish forever. We have, th we have thought on your steadfast love, O God, in the midst of your temple, as your name, O God, so your praise reaches to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is filled with righteousness. Let Mount Zion be glad. Let the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments. Walk about Zion. Go around her. Number her towers. Consider well her ramparts. Go through her citadels that you may tell the next generation that this is God, our God, forever and ever. He will guide us forever. Father, I thank you for this uh, afternoon, Lord. Um, I thank you that we can come together, Father, worship you, pray together, and feed on your word. Lord, um, as this psalm says, Father, you... Um, the same way that the psalmist is speaking about about you, Father, in in Zion, Lord, the same the same God resides in us today, Lord. As you continue to guide us, as you are the righteousness, you continue to sanctify us. Sanctification in the sense that, Lord, you you transform us and you make us holy, just as Jesus you've asked us to be holy, just as our heavenly Father is holy. So, Lord. We thank you that the same way we can, we can be, uh, you can be as a fortress in our lives day in and day out, guiding us just as the psalmist says as well. You guide us, Lord. And the same way, Father, we continue to ask that you guide us uh, in every day in your word and in our actions that they may be pleasing and honoring to you, Lord. The same way, all glory, all honor is uh, only yours, Father. I pray that all that we do will give you and point towards you. Because at the end of the day, this life is a mist, Father. And we want to make sure that, uh, not that we want to make sure, but you will, what you've started, complete what is good and what you have started in us, Father. And we, I pray that, that every single moment we ponder on your word and we ponder on, on glorifying and bringing in, bringing in the this and all our actions towards you so father thank you that you are this guide for us forever we worship you we praise you and i pray lord as today we sing and as we we feast on on your word lord may our ears be opened may we focus on what you have for us today and how we can apply this in our lives amen I'd ask you to stay standing and keep your masks on as we sing these songs, beginning with His Mercy is More. Praise the Lord. 
His mercy is more Stronger than darkness New every morn Our sins they are many His mercy is more What love could remember And all knowing he counts not their sum thrown into a sea without bottom or shore our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the lord his mercy is more stronger introduced last week, Ancient of Days.
What a wonderful truth. Our God is the ancient of days. Father, when we'll stand in your presence and we will think back on these moments when we sang these songs, gathered around your word, the moments we had in prayer, the moments we were tempted and you delivered us, the moments we felt fearful and you comforted us with truth, the moments we doubted and you reminded us through a verse or from a brother who's shared a verse or a phone call, whatever means you used to reach out to us and we will see how your hand was behind it all and making sure that your elect would reach your presence and be there joyful, blameless. Lord, what an amazing grace. What an amazing salvation. Who are we that you should love us so? Who are we that you should go out of your way this, in this manner and to be so meticulous with us? What is man? We're just a speck on the planet Earth, which is a speck in the universe, a speck within a speck. And here you are so concerned with us. Why would you do this? Why would you reveal your infinity your greatness, your majesty, your compassion. Why would you do this, O oh Lord? We're still baffled by it all, and we will continue to be baffled throughout eternity. We will continue to be amazed and in awe with this great God. Oh, how we look forward to seeing you. Until then, keep us faithful, obedient. Keep us on the path of righteousness, in love with you and in love with each other. For to love each other pleases you so much. We thank you for this day and for this time that we have of gathering together as the saints of God. And we pray that you would strengthen us today with grace as your word will be studied and delved into. Strengthen those who will follow online, those who are fearful, those who are weak, those who are discouraged. Strengthen your flock, we pray, and use your people to do this, O oh, Father. Be glorified in each one of your children for your name's sake. Amen. Please be seated, beloved. So I believe next Sunday will be the last Sunday, tentatively speaking, that we will be meeting at 2.30 and at 4 p.m. As of the first Sunday of June, if things stay the way they are, uh, we will be having one gathering, but we'll confirm that later on. So for next Sunday, let's re pre-register as usual. There are the two gatherings, 2.30 and 4 p.m. And um, we will uh, look forward to having our last gathering together uh, this way. And more importantly, having our gathering as one in June. Once the gathering is over, the Lord has been giving us wonderful sunny Sundays. Uh, please do make your way to the outdoors. Andrew will be there, and he will be answering all the questions that will arise from this message. Thank God there are also the home groups, the prayer meetings, and that all take place on Zoom. The WOW event is happening this coming Friday at 7.30. The Zoom ID will be mailed, emailed rather to you. Uh, ladies, I uh, encourage other ladies, remind them of this, that this Friday you'll be going through chapter 13 of the book of Exodus. And uh, you're um, going to be encouraged and strengthened with the word of God. So prepare your hearts just by reading the chapter in the meanwhile. And the brethren continue to praise the Lord. We all praise God for his provision and for the way the Lord has been faithfully providing throughout these months. And he'll continue to do so because we are doing his work. And what a joy and honor that we are doing his work. I speak to many uh, other members of churches and pastors who are just um, very surprised as to how we are moving and going, forging ahead in the way we are. And we're doing a lot of work. We are not letting grass grow under our feet. That's not us as a church. And that's only by God's grace. We're not doing work because we are better than anyone else. Anything we do, we do it because of God's grace. And so we want to realize this and then give ourselves fully for the work of the gospel. Why did God save us? To do his work. 
and to bring him honor and glory while we're here on earth. So, beloved, let's turn to uh, 1 Peter chapter 4. And we're going to be looking at the passage in its entirety, which is 17 to 19. For the past few weeks, we've been reading that. And the verse we're looking at in particular today is verse 18. Last week, I, we, we started dealing with this verse, and we're going to finish dealing with it today. By God's grace, I hope to finish it today. 1 Peter chapter 4. So please stand with me for the reading of God's word. First Peter chapter 4, uh, verse 17 to verse 19. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins first with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? Therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God are to entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you with grateful hearts. We are aware of our limitations. I'm very much aware, and so I ask for grace. Grace for myself and grace for those who are the flock of Christ, that together we may have right now thoughts and meditations that are pleasing to you, and that the words of my mouth may be acceptable to you as well. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Please be seated. Last week, we started looking at verse 18, where Peter tells us that it is with difficulty that the righteous are saved. And we debunked two erroneous interpretations of this passage. The first being that the Christian walk is difficult. And some of you here may think that. Christian walk is so difficult, it's so hard. I can't do it. That is totally a lie from the pit of hell. We saw from Scripture that the Christian walk is not difficult. It is impossible. If it is difficult, those who are strong amongst us could do it. When you look at Moses in Scripture, you say, wow, look at all he did. He didn't do it with his strength. He didn't do it because he was more righteous. The man murdered someone in Egypt, and he fled. He was a weak man. He stammered. That's Moses. Moses was not a strong man. After God broke him, made him realize, you are weak. Now let me show my strength through your weakness. Moses was not a strong man at all. That's why Jesus said, abide in me and you will bring fruit. The Christian life is not difficult. It is impossible. For this reason, Jesus said to his hearers in this day, for I say to you that unless your righteousness far surpasses, pay attention, far surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now you may say, okay, who were the Pharisees? Well, they were the Hebrew of Hebrews. Remember Paul using that expression? I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. I was the cream of the crop. It's like me saying to you, an Aboriginal is not a true Canadian. Well, you say, yes, they are. Europeans are not true Canadians, maybe. You know, people from Africa living here are not true Canadians. People from South America, Central America, who migrated here are not true Canadians. From Europe or wherever else. But Aboriginals, they are the true Canadians. Well, imagine me saying that the Aboriginals are not true Canadians. That's what Jesus was saying. That the Pharisees will not make it to heaven. Why? Because they were trying very hard. Very hard. And they didn't know the life of grace. The Pharisees were considered first nation people. But heaven, Jesus said, does not belong to them. The Christian life is not difficult. It is impossible from a human standpoint. No one but Christ lived that life. And anyone he gives grace to lives that life. 
just like no one walked on water but Peter, because not because Peter had the ability to walk on water, but because Jesus gave him the grace to walk on water. The life that pleases God is a life that is lived by faith. For this reason, Jesus said to Peter, when he sank and put, he pulled him back out, why did you doubt? When we sink as Christians, after walking by grace, and we sink and walk and sink, and I've had many of those experiences, it's always the same thing. Why did you doubt, John? Why did you doubt? God brings about this amazing work of grace to live like Christ, so that we too can say like with Paul, it is no longer I that lives, but Christ lives in me. His joy is in me. His peace is in me. His love is in me. His holiness is in me. It's Christ's life being lived out. That's the first error we debunk, the first wrong interpretation of this passage. The second interpretation that is also wrong when it comes to, and it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, is this one, that God has a hard time saving those who are um, lost and he has a hard time bringing them all the way to heaven because we see people falling away by the wayside, people who make a confession of faith, who got baptized, and then they stop believing or they walk away or whatever the case may be. We see Christians getting weak and they become overcome with discouragement and they stop attending or they stop belonging to a family of faith. Those were his or his forever. Notice what Psalm 33 verse 10 says. The plan of the Lord stands forever. What well, God has planned. Who's going to frustrate his plan? The plans of his heart from generation to generation. If God wants to save, he's going to save. Those who he wants to bring into heaven, he is going to bring into heaven at all costs. Again, Isaiah 14, 27. For the Lord of armies has planned. Another version says, for the Lord of hosts. Same thing. The Lord of armies. Armies of heaven. The Lord of armies has planned. Who can frustrate it? And as for his stretched out hand, who can turn it back? So when God saves a soul, he saves him forever. Our God is not struggling to keep the universe in place and keep everything running. The other day, someone sent me a video of planet Earth and compared to another planet and then another planet and then to another planet and then to other planets that have been discovered as of late. The planet Earth compared to these other planets is a speck. Compared to the planets is a speck. It is mind-boggling how vast the, our cosmos is, this galaxy. And then there are other galaxies with other planets which are innumerable. And then beyond that, they say, there is the black hole, whatever that means. And they have no clue what's there. But God's word tells us what's there. God's word says this, God's splendor is above the heavens. His splendor. We can't see it. One day we will. And that God makes sure that all of this is perfectly fine-tuned. Because it is. Everything in this world and in this universe, in this cosmos, runs perfectly. You think he can't save us? It is so vast to tell us every single day, look up, look up, look, and see and astronauts and scientists and physicists and astronomers are amazed with the size of the universe. And we haven't seen its limit, they say. How vast is it? The other day I was speaking to someone who I've been meeting for quite some time. I will not mention his name because I think he watches the videos. And, um, and he believes in evolutionary uh, atheist, right? So he doesn't believe either in God. And he believes everything just evolved after millions and billions of years. I said, you have, I told him, you have a lot of faith. I don't have your kind of faith. He looked at me puzzled. What do you mean? Well, I believe it's so perfect and it's so amazing that there has to be a designer. You believe 
all of this, with all its perfections, with all its beauty, its vastness, this finely tuned universe, if anything were to be a little off, everything would be in, in, in havoc. It would just be havoc. Everything is in perfect place, perfectly aligned, and this all happened by evolution. Congratulations. You have amazing faith in nothing. He didn't know what to say for a moment. <laughs> he was stunned. He said, your faith is bigger than mine, much bigger. You become a Christian? My goodness, I'm, I'd be surprised at what you're going to be doing with your faith. He didn't know what to say. Because you need that kind of a faith to believe that everything just popped up on its own. God made it happen. May God open our eyes to his incontestable sovereignty. He is sovereign. And those he saves, he saves forever. Look at what Hebrews 7.25 says. This is a powerful passage. Consequently, he, meaning the Lord, is able to save to the uttermost. To the uttermost. To the end. Those who draw near to God through him. Since he always lives to make intercession for them. He saves us completely. Another version says. In other words, there's nothing that can stop God from saving us and from keeping us saved to the very end. Or as Paul reminds the church of Rome in chapter 5 verse 10. For if while we were enemies. Now think about it. While we were enemies of Christ. We were reconciled then to God by the death of his son. Much more now that we are his and we are reconciled as his children, shall we be saved by his life. What does that mean? We're saved by his life as high priest. So if he reconciled us, if he won the battle on the cross and he said, it's finished, I saved all those I came to save. He saved you then. He didn't save you after then. You, sometimes you say, you know, I thank God that I got saved at, I don't know, when I was 13. That's when you came to know about your salvation. He saved you 2,000 years ago. In fact, even before that, in eternity past, he says, I am saving him. Why him? For no other reason but because it will bring me glory. That's why God saved you. Not to make you happy, but to make himself happy. That's God. That's his sovereignty. And so Paul says if he saved us while we were enemies, that happened a long time ago when Adam sinned. Where all of mankind became the enemy of God. That included you. That included me. And then out of that bunch of enemies, he chooses and he chooses and he chooses to make those his very own. So today we're going to be looking at Three questions as we delve into the meaning of Peter's words. Three questions. First, who is being saved? Two, what are they saved from? And three, what difficulty is Peter alluding to? What does he mean by when he says that it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved? So, first, who is being saved? Well, Peter says that the righteous are being saved. And so the next question is obvious. Is Peter saying that only those who live righteous lives are being saved? Well, that was, is that what he's saying? And the rest are not. Well, who are the righteous that Peter is talking about? So we can only settle this if we know who the righteous are that Peter is speaking about. To understand who the righteous are, we need an example of someone in Scripture who is saved and without a doubt. Not someone that we think is being saved. Not someone that we hope is going to be saved. But one, someone that is saved. 100% saved. Well, we have a good illustration. The thief on the cross. There are many examples in scriptures, but I'll take this one because I think it's an excellent one. It drives the point home rather well. So according to Matthew, there are two thieves that were crucified with Jesus on the cross. On and they were being led with Jesus to Golgotha, the place of the skull. That's what it means, the place of the skull, where 
it says that they were crucified. But on their way there, the two thieves both were insulting Jesus. Both. Both were cursing him. Both were making fun of him. Now, it's interesting. They were being crucified too, right? They're carrying their cross as well. And, of course, you, don't, you didn't carry the entire cross. It was much too heavy. They carried the crossbar, right? Not the entire uh, patibulum. So they're carrying this, they're, 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 their share of the cross. The other thief is carrying his share of the cross. And then there's Jesus carrying his share of the cross. And as they're carrying their, this crossbar, each one is crossbar, you have um, uh, them two cursing Jesus, both of them. Not just one. Both are cursing both started that day as unbelievers. Please remember this. Both started that day. They woke up both as unbelievers. Both had no clue Jesus was. Both had never met him. Both probably had never heard of him, most likely. Maybe they did. We don't know. But in Luke 23, we discover that one of the thieves is penitent. He says things that not even the disciples had understood things that are completely mind-boggling. The truth this man confesses. So what hour this happened, we have no clue. But it happened, obviously, while he's on the cross. So while the nails were hammered into his hands and into his feet, and then he's being hauled up the vertical part of the cross, and then he's placed on this cross, hanging with Jesus and his companion in arms and crime, rather, we see this man confessing several truths that are very surprising. There is no way to explain the complete turnabout of this criminal. He, like I said, he had no previous contact with Jesus. He had no formal training in theology. Perhaps had never picked up a Bible or because those scrolls were very expensive and they were in synagogues. And people who turned to crime were often kids who had been abandoned by their fathers or people who grew up in poverty. How could this man acknowledge so many glorious truths after brief, a brief encounter with Jesus Christ? How? No conversation transpired between the both of them. Nothing. Nothing was said except what Jesus uttered when he would say, I thirst. Father, forgive them. Into your spirit I command my spirit. What? Did he say to him, nothing. But listen to what happens. And one of the criminals who was, Luke 23, by the way, verse 39, one of the criminals who were hanged railed at him saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. So that's one of them. But the other rebuked him, saying, do you not fear God? Now, I want you to pay attention to this. This man did not start the day as an honest man. This man was a criminal. Do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? We indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Seven truths this man confessed which reveal the kind of righteousness that qualifies us for heaven. I want you to pay attention here. Seven truths that you must believe. And this says, I am one of these. You do not believe one of these. You're not qualified for heaven. Simple as that. This man reveals seven truths. And it is God who gave him this revelation. Just like God gave Peter the revelation that Jesus is the Son of God. For Jesus said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Just the same as when Jesus received the 70 who came back, who were saying, demons, demons, they're, they're subject to us in your name. And the, Jesus turns to the Father and says, Father, I thank you that you did not reveal these things to the wise and to the understanding but to little children, infants. Revelation, revelation is key. First, he believed in a future judgment. Notice what he says. Do you not fear God? 
Well, if this is God, which God? There is a future judgment. There is a judgment awaiting all of us. He understood that. Since we are under the same sentence of condemnation, says we are being sentenced now, this is nothing what's going to happen tomorrow. The wrath of God is a sure thing. It awaits everyone outside of Christ. Everyone. Secondly, he believed he was guilty. We indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward for our deeds. Verse 41. He believed he was guilty. You know how many people don't believe they're guilty? Most people say, oh, I'm a good man. I think I'm a good person. I haven't done anything wrong. I mean, yeah, maybe a thing here too, but unless we understand we are guilty, that we are sinners deserving of judgment, we haven't understood much. That's the righteous person. A righteous person understands that he is a vile sinner deserving of judgment. So first, a righteous person understands that there's a future judgment. Secondly, a righteous person understands that he is guilty. Third, he believed that Jesus was sinless. But this man has done nothing wrong. How could he say that? Did he examine his life? How could he say some, of someone he never met, this man has done nothing wrong? How? Revelation. Revelation. Nothing else. Four, he believed that Christ's death was not final. He said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He believed in the resurrection. He believed it. The disciples didn't believe that. They were all in hiding. Nobody believed it. <laughs> The Pharisees remembered. I think he said this. We better seal the tomb. But the disciples did not believe that. They had no clue. But this man believed in the resurrection. Please explain that. There's no explanation but one. It was revealed to him. He believed that the death of Christ was not final. How wonderful. Then he believed that Jesus was king. Not only will he come back, but he's going to come back as king. You have no clue what you just did. You just made him stronger. He is coming back as the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He believed that when you come back into your kingdom. Then he believed that Jesus could not only could forgive him, but also make room for him in the kingdom of heaven. Well, how did this man understand this? Remember me. When you come into your kingdom, remember me. Do you believe this? Do you believe these truths? If you are, then you're righteous. But if you don't believe any one of these truths, then you're not righteous. Because this man had nothing to show for his righteousness. He had no good deeds. He lived a life of crime. He had nothing at all. It was salvation by faith and by faith alone. And then lastly, he believed in Jesus' reply. When Jesus told him, today you will be with me in paradise. Well, I don't know. I'm not sure, you know. How many Christians? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I wonder. I wonder. I... Please. The Lord's word is final. With the heart one believes, with the mouth we confess, he believed it. And he went into heaven because Jesus said, you will be with me in paradise. And whatever Jesus says is true. It's the truth. Seven truths that he confessed. That he believed. In Ephesians 2 verse 8, Paul says, By grace you have been saved. That's what happened to this man. He received grace. Through faith. What does that mean? You are saved by grace. And through faith, why? Because faith is the fruit of regeneration. And this is not of yourselves. That faith doesn't come from you. Oh, I'm going to muster up faith now, and I'm going to believe in what the, Jesus says. You can't do that. Nobody can do that. It's a gift of God, not a result of works. This man had no works to show, had no good deeds. What good deeds could he show? 
I committed this crime, I committed that crime. I started committing, living a life of crime from, as, a, as a child. I became a petty thief, and then from one thief, thievery to another, I became a callous criminal. What could he show? He showed nothing. A revelation of divine grace in his life. The final hour, he believed and he expressed his belief in these wonderful truths. Because the gift of new birth is a sovereign work, and it's a miracle. He was not asked, do you want to receive Jesus? Please lift up your hand. I know it's nailed. Just take out the nail and just lift. No, do you want to receive? He wasn't asked that. None of that. It was monergistic. It was divine. It was sovereign. It was God gifting his son with the salvation just before he comes from the grave. I'm going to gift you this, my son. A worst kind of thief, I'm going to bring him in to show everyone that it is me and me alone that saves. Can we understand this? Or we're going to question God. The Holy Spirit did a unique work in this man's heart and brought him to new life. He regenerated him. As he was dying with his final breath, he received new life. It's amazing. Only God could do things like this. And when you come to think of it, we're all dying. Right? We're all slowly falling, drawing near to our moment of death. It could be 10 years from now. It could be 20. It could be 30. It could be tomorrow. We're all going to that final moment. And yet, God monergistically, God sovereignly brings life into those who are his. In the days of Luther during the Black Plague, People would say, in life, death, in life, death. And Luther would go, no, 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 he would say, in death, life, in death, life. Yes, we're all dying, but there's life in death. That's the believer. He believes in it. That man, as he was dying and giving up his ghost, as he was exfiscating and the, his ribcage was crushing his lungs, not allowing him to breathe, he said, uh, today, rem-, he said, rather, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. Remember me. Those are his final words. And he became a child of God. He became righteous. But here was an unrighteous man who became righteous. That's how God saves. That's how he saves. Salvation is always by grace. Alone. Through faith. Alone. Always. There were no deeds this man could have presented to the Father by which he could be approved. And the Lord shows us with this illustration how he saves. How he does it. It's unique. It's powerful. It's sovereign. It's monergistic. It's divine. It's sovereign salvation. It's him doing the work. If we believe, it's because he does it, and no other person. So what are the righteous saved from? What are they saved from? It's an important question. As I mentioned last week, there are people who say, um, I've been saved from a life of crime, I've been saved from drugs, I've been saved from a life of meaninglessness, I was empty, I was wandering this earth, I didn't know what I was doing, I was saved from all of that, thank God, he saved me. And, and as, it, as bad as those problems are, they are not our ultimate problem. Salvation is far greater than that. God didn't have to give up his son to save us from meaninglessness. All he had to do is send us one visit of an angel and you would have a meaningful life. One moment of terror by one angel. Believe me, you would no longer be meaningless. Right? He could have saved us from those things in any, any other way. He saved us from something far greater. Our salvation was secured by Christ, paying the ultimate price. The Lamb of God came to die a bloody death. And God paid such an enormous price for us specks, insignificant individuals. God gave us so much worth by sending his son. Isn't that something? We're specks, and God gave us worth. We're nobodies. He made us into somebodies. We were slaves, and he made us into sons. We were wandering the earth with condemnation on us, and he made us sit at his table. That's everything. That's everything. Why did he commission his son for such a horrific mission? 
to be crucified. We definitely don't deserve it. It's not that we're the center of the reader. is, oh, my God, how God loves me. Yes, oh, he loves me. I'm so special. I am I'm really special. Please don't ever think that. He's special. He's special. We don't deserve what he did for us. What would have been our destiny had Jesus not died on the cross? You don't have to guess. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3. Among them, meaning everyone else, we too, that means us as Christians, lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the rest. What is Paul saying? Everyone in this world is under the wrath of God. Everyone, from the time Adam sinned, Adam and Eve sinned, every single one is condemned to meet the wrath of God, except those he sovereignly chooses. He chooses them not throughout this life. He chose them way back in eternity past. In his sovereign will, God determined to save a number, and he did this by doing the unthinkable by giving up his son to die on the cross, and he faced the wrath that we deserve on that cross. The wrath that had, was coming to me, he places it on his son. This was a plan that they agreed to together. Jesus says, I lay down my life. Nobody takes it away from me. Not Pilate, not Herod, not Rome, no one. I lay it down. I have power to take it back. So the wrath of God was poured out on him, so that those who he had chosen would become righteous, like the thief on the cross. Like the thief on the cross. So ultimately, God saves us from what? From himself. When he saves us, he saves us from himself. He doesn't save us from the devil. Please don't say that. Please, don't say that. He doesn't save us from the world. No. He doesn't save us from some dark ghosts or some spirits? No, no, no. He saved you from his wrath. The wrath that you deserved, God saved you from it. That's salvation. To save you from the devil would not have cost his son. Wouldn't have cost him his son at all. To save you from some spirit, or to save you from a meaningless life, or to save you from crime, to save you from unhappiness, or to save you from whatever else, you fill in the, the blanks. He saved you from himself. He saved you from the wrath that was coming to all of us. That's what Paul says. That's what Scripture says. In his sovereign will, God determined to save a number. Had it not been for this glorious plan of salvation, our lot would have been with the rest. The rest. So the question is never should be, what happens to the people in Africa and what happens to the people in, and what happens to the people on the moon? And please, the question should be, why do you do this with me? That's the question. The question is, why did he take me, an insignificant speck, and make something out of nothing? Why did he do that? Why did he choose to spare me? That's the question we should be asking ourselves every single day. And the answer is one. It's to live for him. Nothing else. Nothing else. Because nothing else matters. He saved us from the wrath that we deserve. Hence Peter's words in verse 18 at the end when he says, what will become of the godless man and sinner? When he says that, he goes, if we are saved with difficulty... What will become of the godless man and sinner? Who's the godless man? The one who's never been exposed to the written word of God. Think of all the millions who've never been exposed to the written word of God, but they have an inner witness that tells them that God exists. And their conscience bears witness, uh, bears uh, testimony to that inner witness. That's the godless man. He has within himself, as Paul says in Romans 1, a conscience that tells him about the existence of God, but he suppresses truth. The sinner instead is the one who is fully aware of what the written law says. 
and yet decides to defy God and violate the written law of God. The sinner is the one who knows what God's word says, but is defiant in his sin. So you have the godless, those who've never heard, never been exposed to the law of God, and those, the sinner, those who know God's law, and yet choose to stay in disobedience. Both of them, Peter says, what will be their end? What? It's not that one will be treated differently than the other, in the sense they both face wrath. But the judgment of this one who knows the written law will be more severely. That's why for the Jews, as I've often said, the law condemns them even more than for those who've never had the written law of God. However, both are under the wrath of God. And so Paul, writing to the church of Rome, says this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, that means anyone who's never been exposed to the word of God and lives ungodly lives, and unrighteousness, people who know God's law, of people who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So this wrath one day will be made manifest. Today, we don't have God's wrath being manifest. We have moments of wrath, moments, little moments here, little moments there, little moments of God's anger, just as a reminder. I told this person who uh, I was speaking about to lastly, uh, last, this past week, and um, he was telling me, look at all the bad things in the world. Look at all the bad things, because that's what most people think, right? Look at all the bad things. And they don't pay attention to the loving kindness of God. I said, tell me something. Um, your, you know, your, uh, your health and your property and uh, your family and all the blessings you have in your life. Where did that come from? Because he's an evolutionist. He's, um, well, you know, uh, evolution, evolution. All right, so all the bad things you blame on God, right? But all the good things you credit evolution, evolution or luck or chance or fortune, right? Fortune is a big thing. May fortune be with you. And if you're really into Star Wars, may the force be with you. So we never give credit, credit to God for the good things. But we blame him for all the bad. You see, God is responsible for all the bad in this world. Not culpable. God is not directly culpable. He's not the author of evil. But he allows enough evil in the world to jolt people's memories. He brings suffering to cause us to think of our ways and repent because there is an ultimate day of wrath. Now this message is not pleasant to people. I'll tell you why. Because we deep down feel we deserve good. We don't deserve good. We don't. We receive good from God's hand. This beautiful sunny day, our blessings, the children we have, the home we have, whatever we have, everything comes from the hand of God. But somehow we give ourselves credit for everything we have. We give ourselves credit. Christians are the number one who give themselves credit. Because if we would not give ourselves credit, we would not complain when something is removed. We would not complain if we'd lose a job. We would not complain if we get sick. We would say, thank you. But we don't. We don't. Because deep down, we believe we deserve good things. How sad. No one is more messed up, I say, than Christians. We have this prosperity garbage being preached over and over, telling them, you are blessed, you are blessed, you are blessed, as if they deserve it. We don't deserve anything. We don't deserve anything. And for those of them, and for those who've been deceived by this lie, they will meet the wrath of God unless God miraculously, sovereignly, and mercifully delivers them from this deception. Otherwise, they'll be just deceived and at the end face the wrath of God. That wrath is what God saved us from. Not because we're good, not because we deserve it, not because we impressed him. None of us impressed him. We can't impress God. There's nothing we can do that impresses God. God mercifully, sovereignly chose to save us. So what is the difficulty Peter is alluding to? Peter is saying that the righteous, which are those who've been chosen to spend eternity with God, not because they deserve it, not because they've earned it, not because they're good, they've been saved from the wrath that one day will be 
manifested one day today as part and parcel of their salvation have hardships, suffering, persecution. That's it. They're saved with difficulty. They're saved with hardships. They're saved with persecution. They're saved with suffering. They're not saved and no suffering. They're not saved and no hardships. It doesn't happen, church. It doesn't happen. Salvation is accompanied by hardship. That's the truth. How many times you just fall apart? As soon as a hardship comes, in, oh, God, where are you? Where are you, God? Where? Let's grow up. This is what Peter's been saying all along. Nothing else. You're a child of God. You can expect hardship to accompany your Christian walk. Too many Christians have come to expect that because we've been saved from hell, from eternal judgment, there's no condemnation. Hallelujah. And you know what? All the blessings are all mine too. I can have all my Bentleys. I can have all my Rolexes. No, no, okay, I don't want to be that greedy. I can have good health. I can have a family. I can have children. I can have no problems in my life. Please! One day Peter and the disciples were listening to Jesus and, and Jesus says something that is very surprising. Jesus told him in Mark 10, verse 28, Behold, we have left everything and have followed you. Had I been there, I said, Peter, what did you leave, a boat? I mean, really. He left heaven, get it? That's me, not, not Jesus. Jesus was much more merciful. Jesus says, truly, I, I say to you, there's no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms. And they had farms. Unfortunately, we don't have farms, but for my sake and for the gospel's sake, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms. And this is where the prosperity gospel guy says, yep, I told you so. We're going to get farms. I wish you get one. And you smell it all. And then Jesus adds, along with persecution. Along, please underline that, please. Just please underline it. Along with persecution. That, see, the, the, the prosperity gospel just stop it there. Now, what does Jesus mean that you're going to receive mothers and brothers? Can you receive another mother? Oh, no, of course not. You can't receive another mother. Now, if your mother denies you and says, you're not my child because you've embraced the faith and I've had people, I've known people, my mother was one of them. They, a whole bunch of you just turned against her. You know what she found? She found others that treated her like a daughter. That's what it means. You lose your property. Don't worry about it. You're going to have people going to receive you into their homes. They're going to treat you because there's going to be a family of God that's going to love you. But remember... Even though you're going to get this kind of treatment, you're still going to be persecuted. You're going to be. So what is Jesus saying to Peter? You've left it, Peter? Well, it's not going to be easy from here on in. You left your house. You know what you're going to get? Persecution. I left heaven. You know what I'm going to get? The cross. That's Christianity. It's not, I leave. You know, I, I hear, uh, there's one song I... <laughs> I, I <laughs> It's an Italian song. Io lascio tutto. Io lascio I left a life of emptiness. I left a life of meaninglessness. I left a life that made no sense of sin. Oh, but I found Jesus. And it makes it sound as if when you find Jesus, that's it. Everything is going to be hunky-dory. There's joy in suffering when you are the Lord's. We don't want that. Give me the joy without the suffering. Please remove that. I want the farms, I want the mom, I want the brother, I want the blessings, I want the good things in life. I want to come to church and just be loved by everybody and have no persecution in life, just no, nothing. Please, just no persecution. Can that possible? Can we have that? Jesus says, no. 
Persecution. Cross. Cross. The cross. The cross. It's part of Christianity. The cross. But then in the age to come, you have eternal life. Why is Jesus raised to a higher level than anyone else? Because he endured the lowest descent and he endured the worst possible death for having done nothing but good and living a holy life. And that is why God has highly, highly, he was already highly exalted, but the name of Jesus is the highest name ever because that name signifies that he left heaven, he embraced the cross, and for our sake, and then brings us back into heaven. But who does he bring back? Those who are saved with difficulty, with hardships, with persecution, with suffering. If you want no difficulty, if you want no persecution, please join Disneyland. Do not become a Christian. That's the truth. And that's the truth churches don't want to hear. That's the truth Christians have want nothing about it. They want nothing about it. Nothing. How many times? Every day I meet people. Every single day when I speak to people at the cafe, because that's my center of ministry, or else I'm going to do ministry, right? So I got to do it there. Always complaining about something. I wish I could just take the people who live in spots that are really war-torn, bring them here, and just have them listen to these individuals. They say, why are they complaining? They have a latte in their hand. It's a sunny day. They, they, they're, they're, everything's okay for them. It looks apparently, but it's not, obviously. Why are they complaining? Why are we complaining? And Christians should never join in that kind of talk, ever. Ever. Christians should not join. We should be saying, thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your mercy. Thank you that you saved us from wrath to come. And even though there's difficulty and hardships that you custom make for us, that you weave into our lives, for our good, so that we can share in your holiness, we thank you. So at the end, we can be presented to you, blameless, with exceeding joy, for your glory and for your fame. That is the plan of God. Let's rejoice in it. He is an amazing God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your precious word, how it corrects us, how it rebukes us, how it convicts us, how it shapes our thinking. We have so many cobwebs that we've embraced because of the world in which we live. So many lies that we've accepted as true. Your word, Lord, your word is so needed. Please don't let us be deceived. Please don't let us be carried away by every wind of doctrine. Please don't let us be fooled by the spirit of this age. Rather, let us be shaped by your word to be filled with your spirit. I pray for the flock of Christ that is here present and that is listening online eventually. I pray that you would strengthen each one, O oh Father, that they would be filled with your truth, for only your truth sets us free so that we walk in your ways. Lord, indeed, you've saved us from your wrath. you saved us from that awful day. Now may we live for you, for your glory. In whatever persecution, whatever difficulty comes our way, whatever suffering you send us, may we embrace it and may we rejoice because you've counted us worthy to suffer. Thank you for that. We praise you. We give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, beloved.